I'm daunted after such impressive um, sharing by um, the two other panel members. Um, and I'd like to take you through a journey, a short journey, um, which I call en route to communications 2.0, although I saw that uh, Andre was mentioning 3.0, so maybe we should be on to 3.0. Value creation through communications. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to unpack the three areas, value, creation, and communication. And before I go into that more sort of vision of where I think we as communications are heading or ought to be heading, I'm just going to share some statistics, some analysis that we do at Greenpeace. When I joined um, four years, four and a half years ago, there was um, quite a bit of measurement happening and I would indeed dare to say it was all in that um, output area. And I remember saying to the colleagues that I found there, are we output over impact? And the reaction, well, the sheer output of Greenpeace is impactful. Um, I'm not really sure whether um, we've cracked that one four and a half years later. What I, do, um, what I can share is that through the four and a half years, we've upped the game of analysis, making sure that what it is that we measure actually is being discussed and will hopefully therefore make our communication strategies and our campaign strategies smarter and sharper. This is one example of um, the social media coverage that we're analyzing versus the activities that we do as an organization, and this is part of our polar campaign. We also do it in um, the traditional media space, but this is the one on uh, social media, which, as you can appreciate, is extremely crucial for um, an organization as Greenpeace. We have many different ways that we do our analysis, so I'm going to take you through a few of those. This is influencing the news agenda. It's something that we generated two years ago, um, believing that we have three different categories that we could look at, where we make the news, where we shape the news, or where we follow the news. Where we make the news is just us generating it. It is us making sure that um, there's an action, and actions speak louder than words, very strong, obviously, for Greenpeace. And those are the ones like Save the Arctic campaign, but you can also look at the detox campaign that we've been doing. It's just about us, we determine it. There's nothing out there in the news agenda space that um, is relevant. The other one is shaping news. There's something happening, it's relevant to our campaigns, but we make more out of it. The Fukushima nuclear disaster two years ago is a clear example of that, where making sure that we would not exploit it in the wrong way. In fact, the people came to us because we have a lot of experts who could really help Fukushima uh, in determining what it needed to do but clearly it benefited um, the organization to make the point about the dangers of nuclear um, power. And if you think about the shift that Germany have gone through from um, going into really the renewable energy space, that was definitely a journey that Greenpeace Germany could go on because of what had happened um, in Fukushima. And then the last one is following the news. It's for communication professionals the least interesting one, I would say. Things are happening anyway like the UN um, FCCC, the process on climate change. Um, we don't really, we follow, we're one of the many partners in there. Um, we do get a lot of coverage often at those events, but it's really not us shaping it. It is another factor. Um, disasters as well that could happen is where we follow. And what we learn from this is, does it give us a, few, a further opportunity? And I mean, Andre was uh, talking about budget cuts. Obviously, you can appreciate that we are challenged with financial and human resources as well. Don't have large budgets in that respect. So where should we focus and what is this telling us? Should we maybe skip that whole following the news completely? Should we just focus, look at the other ones? But what is our vision and mission as an organization? And therefore, we'll need to do certain things because that will, in our theory of change, really get to that green and peaceful future that we want to go for as an organization i.e. this allows us to have a discussion within the organization to determine what our program should really look like. 
We have different sets of values that we stand for as an organization, and we also um, are part of a certain ways of doing things, i.e. research is extremely crucial for us. Big actions out there, I know that many of you might perceive Greenpeace of just shouting loud and it's not based on research. The organization learned lessons. So whenever we do that, we make sure that it's based on facts and figures. We launch reports, we've done the research, we've got scientists inside of Greenpeace, we work with external scientists. So does that come through? So things like investigate and expose, which is part of that uh, piece of work, does that come through in the media that we analyze? And by the way, we um, analyze on an ongoing daily basis 100 media um, globally. That's what this is based on. Independence is another one. It's, um, Again, here it shows it's not coming through quite clearly. It's very crucial, also from a donor perspective. We are not taking any money by governments or corporations. It's purely based on individual money. So we're really independent. We don't need to um, uh, acknowledge anything to a corporate, which put, would put us in a very difficult situation when we are quite clear about the change we're demanding. So our value of independence is quite crucial. So we analyze what comes through, and again, we look at, okay, what does that tell us? And what does it tell us on um, how to differently shape our um, communications? And then last but not least, donors are crucial. I was just mentioning that. So how do we do versus our fellow travelers? It's a word I learned when I joined Greenpeace. I.e., you could look at this as these are our competitors. But what I'd like to say, they're fellow travelers. They are also contributing to making this world a better place. So it's wonderful that other people um, donate money to those organizations because we're all traveling together. But it's important for us to see still how do they do in, those, in the, uh, the global media that we measure? How do we go and how do they go and what can we learn from that? But not everything that we counted counts and not everything that counts can be counted. So I'm going to slightly flip off something I strongly believe in, in terms of measurement and what the previous speakers have also uh, mentioned. But I would like to talk a little bit more about where we're heading and what I call the vision of the communications function as I, I have it. What is important? What are our values? And depending on where you grew up, depending the kind of job you have, have the social setting, um, are you from the global north or the global south? Did you um, have poverty? Have you been in war situations? There's many different things that will determine what you value and what is important to you. I myself, as the introduction showed, have gone through that um, uh, transition um, as a child already at the blackboard wanting to share, going through oil and landing as a fish in the water at Greenpeace. If I would have been here working for a bank, I guess I would have looked at it differently. And I would have looked at, I just use one example of what you can find on value in terms of the business dictionary, but there's different areas where you can um, see it. But basically, if we think about what the paradigm is currently, and mentioning ROI, i.e. investment in the financial part of things, often when we say value creation, what we mean with value is that monetary aspect. Whereas in fact it's far more, and that's the top one, it's what we share, what is desirable, undesirable, what is good and what is bad. Very, very crucial if you think about where we're heading. And the value here of uh, sh stakeholder value and shareholder value, this is often seen as a dichotomy, whereas in fact it shouldn't be a dichotomy, it should really be one and the same. Unpacking, so continuing the creation part. I think we're amazing as communicators, right? We are amazing in our communications from um, Apple through to Starbucks, through to Nike, through to Greenpeace. We are absolutely amazing in the stories we create, the stories we tell. Creation is our profession. But I think we need to, to acknowledge that that is changing. And it's similar, I've heard the, the red threat of my colleagues as well, because creation is not just something that we do anymore. We share it, we don't own our brands, because we live in the digital era. Oral broadcast in digital. And I want to acknowledge Jonas Sachs, because he is the one who came up with the term digital era. He has written a book that I can strongly recommend, Story Wars. 
where he goes from, in the oral tradition, it was the, um, the, the power of the fittest, i.e. those stories that were continued were the ones that were the fittest, the strongest. But then we landed in the broadcast era where you could buy your way through it, i.e. it was the power of the richest. But that's changing. So we're back to that a power of storytelling, to the oral part. But it's a very different game because of the digital uh, reality. So the digital era is changing the name of the game for us as professionals. So therefore, I have this idea um, of where we need to go uh, as uh, communications. And it's based on three A's. Audiences, authenticity, and audacity. Genuine value will be created if we look at audiences in a different way. So I would like to invite all of you that in any communication strategy that you'll be making, you add two audiences to the plan, future generations and Mother Earth. And by doing that, you're forced, whether you work for a company, an organization, to have a different kind of discussion. And you therefore are going to co-create the strategy of the company and the strategy of the organization. Intergenerational equity. So if you think about the creation of equity, i.e. value through communication, intergenerational is really, really key, I believe. And one company that I think gets it quite right, Patagonia, don't know how many of you, or trust that many of you actually will know the brand. Um, they're very clear about that, how seriously they take it. And of course, they would like you to buy a jacket. Um, but as our keynote speaker of this morning was talking about slow food and fast food, there's something about slow fashion. And this is really changing. And the fact that they're um, clear about this is a very impressive one because they are looking at future generations and Mother Earth. Authenticity. Really, if you look at that word of value and validity, it is all about reality, truth, legitimacy. And I think if you think about the art of spinning that we've got so good at as a profession, I think we should go back to base, i.e. image and identity is the same. Just be authentic. Just be honest about what it is that you do, because that will really create the right um, value that I think the world needs, i.e., yes, beautiful creation, but it's not authentic. Out of pipes, don't come, flowers don't uh, come. Yes, it might have a nice filter, but sorry, this is creation, it's not authentic. Yet, if you look at uh, Ben and Jerry's, they are authentic, because their mission as a company is very clear, so it's the one-on-one -on -one translation for communications. And it does go, therefore, back to the strategy of the company, of the organization that you work for. But to do that, I think we'll have to be audacious. We need to be bold as professionals in stepping up and daring to have those conversations with the people that uh, we work with and work for. Audacity, I don't know whether you recognize um, the logo on the right. It is the logo that we came up with as Greenpeace when the uprising started to happen in Taksim Square in Istanbul and further on in Turkey, I think those people are really clearly audacious. And if you think about the media space and what social media has meant there, that's quite amazing and they are remaining quite audacious. But audacity will mean different things for different people. It will mean different things um, for many of you out there. But I think we'll, we'll need to have that in order to create the value for the world. I looked at um, companies that have that. Last year I've been referencing um, how Unilever, I think, is quite audacious in the way they step and go for longer term versus the shorter term. And I think the Triodos Bank um, is pretty audacious too. If you look at what is um, obviously a, a tracker with regards to shares and the way they play with it in terms of poverty, greed, honesty, it's a very different way. It's quite audacious, I believe. And Andre was mentioning yin and yang, and I think the Triodos Bank is saying it quite nicely in terms of follow your heart, but use your head. So for us to get there, like I said, real value creation, I think we need those three A's. And I think it leads us, which is why I've used the symbol that I have, because it's really driving us somewhere, and I think that is purpose. And 
We might have called it corporate social responsibility, whatever it is. And I think we're on the journey. I think you see many businesses do take that very seriously. I think some of the businesses are doing it because they're forced to doing it rather than really believing that that's where they need to head. But if you think further ahead, and if you think about purpose, it changes. And I think we have a beautiful role to play if we look um, at the three A's that I'm suggesting we look at in a different um, way again. And purpose and the world we're heading, because truly, and I'm going to play a Greenpeace on you, we do have that one home, right? And I think we all know in theory that we need many more planets if we're going to sustain the lifestyles that we have. But I think we, we are onto something. I think you see initiatives happening out there that will drive us. And I think as some communicators, we have a beautiful opportunity to create that right value. So CCO, rather than the Chief Communications Officer, I'm not suggesting we start using this title, but I'm suggesting we're going to say, okay, let's be the Chief Challenges Officer. Thank you.